all face crucial moments all of the time. Those moments when our colleagues disappoint us, when our boss is treating us unfairly, when our spouse is letting us down, or our children are treating us badly. And we know in those moments we need to confront. And yet, we don't. Or when we do, it goes badly. Why? I'll tell you why, because I don't, I, I don't exactly understand why as human beings we always ask ourselves this question, but how many of you have been tempted by this thought? What is the worst and most hurtful and personal way I could possibly respond in this moment? Right? Okay, and so then our emotion gets going, it's strong, it's out of control, and what we know is that we tend to, to behave not as well as we could. And in that moment, oftentimes we commit what's called the fundamental attribution error. When looking at other people's behavior, we jump to a conclusion. And we believe in that moment that people are doing what they're doing because they enjoy it. Here's what happens. In our minds, we think to ourselves, I know why he's acting that way, because that's the way he is. Because he's just a jerk, and that's the way he treats people, and that's the way it always is. He's just selfish, he's lazy, he's arrogant, and there's just really nothing I can do about it. Okay? So when we, when we jump to this conclusion, and that's, of course, a bit dramatic in terms of um, explaining what our thought process is, but, but for many of us, the challenge is that we are assigning an attribute as to why people are doing what they're doing. We are fundamentally attributing people's behavior in erroneous ways. And what, what's happening when we jump to the fundamental attribution error is that we are assuming that people behave the way they behave because they are personally motivated to act that way. And this is a very limited view of, of human behavior. So what we need to do is talk about what are some potential ways that we can rethink those conclusions if we want to have more healthy outcomes in our crucial confrontations. If I decide that you act the way you are acting because you are bad and evil and horrible, it is very difficult for me to have an effective confrontation with you because I am filled with judgment. What we want to do is begin to think more broadly and recognize that there are six sources that influence human behavior, not just the one that we so readily conclude. So you'll see here, that we're talking about both motivation and ability. We often forget ability. We assume that if people wanted to behave differently, they would, not realizing that oftentimes people are behaving badly because it is incredibly difficult for them to behave any other way. And so what we want to be able to do is understand that there are lots of different ways for us to understand what's going on that, that motivates people to act in the way that, that they do. And it can be on the personal level. It can also have to do with what others are doing on the social level that perhaps are affecting their choices. And it might also have to do with some of the non-human elements, the structural elements in our environment that could cause people to be acting the way they're acting. I'd like to just walk us through the six sources of influence here. And you'll find that these are delineated by numbers. So I'll walk through each of these. The first source of influence is personal motivation. We've been talking about this. We decide people act the way they do because it brings them pleasure and it's congruent with who they see themselves to be. Okay, but we know that that's not always a full explanation. Source number two suggests that people act the way they do because to do any other action would require skills and ability that perhaps they might not have. They might have an ability issue present that we're not thinking about. Let me just walk you through a scenario here. I want you um, to imagine that you are on a, an executive leadership team and there's a gentleman on your team named Ed. Now, you've both been assigned to different subcommittees, and your subcommittee relies on Ed's subcommittee to get information. Um, your task is to make a presentation to the director, and you need the report from Ed's subcommittee by noon on Friday in order to be able to prepare for your presentation to the director at 3 o'clock on Tuesday. Now, let's say it's Monday. It's 4 o'clock, and you have no report from Ed. How easy would it be for you to, to decide in that moment, Ed never makes our group a priority. He doesn't care that I have a presentation to do. He's just focused on his own needs, and it's just always like this, right? We've assigned personal motivation as the number one reason that Ed is a big fat jerk, okay? Now, what we know is that there could be a personal ability issue present. Now, I won't know this until I check it out with him. These are essentially just guesses, okay? But let's Let's at least have more guesses to work with than just one and see if that moves us into a place where we can check out our, our guesses rather than act them out, which tends not to go so well. Okay? So it could be that there's a personal ability problem present. 
Ed does not know how to use the advanced features of Excel that are required to do this report. And so he's struggling to get the report done. Perhaps there's a social motivation issue present. Perhaps there are actions that other people are doing that are making, um, making it less motivating for Ed to focus on this report. Let's say his boss has been peppering him with urgent deadlines all week, and he could not even come up for air for even a minute until Friday afternoon. So his boss is now making it, making it less of a priority for him. Perhaps there's a social ability issue present. Ed relies on others. You know, Jeannie, his assistant, has always done these reports for him. She's out on maternity leave. She didn't teach him how to do it, and there's no one else who can help him. So he's relying on somebody else for assistance. She's not there. He's stuck as a result. We know that non-human elements come into play as well. Um, when we think of structural motivation issues, we're talking about what kinds of things reward or punish, what kinds of things provide incentives. Um, and for many of us, we look to processes and systems and bonuses and incentives and payouts as, as a kind of incentive for helping us prioritize and motivate us in our work. If I told you that it was never part of Ed's job description that he was going to have to be involved with these subcommittees and his performance review does not take any of his subcommittee work into account, why would he be incented to make that a priority above, above all of his other work? He's a busy, busy man. Right, and finally, if there's a structural ability issue present, we know that things can sometimes make it difficult. For example, if his computer breaks, pretty difficult to turn out an Excel report, right? So what we know is that all of these can go in tandem. Sometimes we just have a few working together, but we limit ourselves when we just see one option in front of us. I'd like to ask you to help me out here now that you have a sense of the six sources of influence. Take a look at this horrible, horrible example of what's going on in my neighborhood. My neighbor, who lives across the street from me, has let his lawn go to pot. And it's looking really bad. In fact, it's bothering me so much because I believe that it's affecting the property value of my house. Now, it would be so easy for me to jump to the fundamental attribution error, which would suggest that the reason my neighbor's lawn looks like this is what? He's lazy. He's just too lazy to care, right? But maybe, just maybe, there's something else going on here. So let's think about what else could be getting in the way. We're going to walk through a diagnosis here. Perhaps he doesn't enjoy mowing. That could be true. It could also be that there's a personal ability problem. He grew up in New York, and he never learned. Never had a yard, right? Maybe there's a social motivation issue going on. He is ticked at his wife, and he is making a point. He is not mowing that lawn until she treats him right. Okay, so now who's my beef with? The wife, right? If I want to see change on my neighbor's behavior, I need to ta start talking to the folks in his family. We know that there could be a social ability challenge. Maybe he's looking to re-landscape, and he doesn't know what kinds of plants are indigenous to the area, and he's put in a call to the garden club, and nobody's calling him back. He can't move until he gets more information. Perhaps there's a structural motivation issue. There's no incentive for him. You know what, we live in a neighborhood where there are no deed restrictions suggesting that he needs to be maintaining his lawn. And this guy owns his own business. How is he going to better spend his time? Bringing in cash by doing his day job or cleaning up the yard when there's no incentive or reward there? Okay, and finally, if there's a structural ability problem, it could be that something's broken. His lawnmower isn't working. So as interested as he is in having an award-winning yard, he's got no tools to get it done. Okay? So you can see here how many of these can come into play. What I'd like to offer you is a gift for when you run into those moments where it's so tempting to jump to the fundamental attribution error. Here's my gift to you. It is a metaphorical set of dice for you to keep in your pocket at all times. Okay? Now picture a die. When you roll a die, there are six possible outcomes. If in troubling moments, we took a moment, just a half a second, and rolled a die, even if it were just mentally, and entertained the notion that perhaps it is not just source number one that is causing us grief, but perhaps there are other potential reasons people are acting badly. It forces us to evaluate what those other potential options might look like. Having more information, having a better understanding of what the problem might be, puts us in a better position to confront effectively when we do. I'd like to share with you um, that a friend of mine, 
could have benefited greatly from, from this, this gift. Um, a couple of years back, um, she and I walked through a very painful journey together. This is a, a dear friend of mine. Her name is Leanne. We grew up together. And Leanne is an only child. And Leanne lost her mother, Marion, at a rather un, uh, young age, and it was quite unexpected. So Leanne was in her early 30s, and Marion was in her late 50s, which in my mind is far too young to lose a mother. And Leanne was obviously heartbroken and, and full of grief and was comforted simply by the knowledge that as an only child, she had always known that she would be the sole heir to her mother's estate. And so she would be comforted by that gift from her mother. Um, her aunts, Marion's sisters, were responsible for executing the will. And Leanne received a phone call um, about three days after Marion passed away from one of her aunts. Now, Leanne wasn't there to take the call, so it was in the form of a voicemail message. And this is what her aunt told her. She said, Leanne, I just wanted to check in and let you know what's happening. Marion's estate is, is set up to be divided, um, uh, or set up to be um, put into the form of a family trust, which will be divided across um, you and me and my sister. So now the three of us will be, will be splitting evenly Marion's estate. So let's talk soon and, and we'll work out details. Now I just want to, I want to pause there. And if you were Leanne, what in that moment do you think she had to have been feeling? Shock, tremendous pain. Because what does she believe her aunts are doing to her? They're taking advantage of her. They're cheating her out of her rightful inheritance. Now, you have to understand, Leanne's father is nowhere in her life. Her mother was, is, is now no longer there. Her aunts are her only family members, and now they've abandoned her. This is, to her, just unacceptable. And she decides in that moment, I'm never talking to them again. They're no longer family to me. If they're going to treat me like this, I, I, can't handle, I can't handle interactions like this. I'm too full of grief, and this is just hurting me even more. So tremendous, tremendous pain. She spent a very miserable night recognizing that she'd been orphaned, not just once, but several times over that week. Now, I'd like to suggest that in that moment, Leanne rolled a one. She jumped to the fundamental attribution error, that her aunts were treating her badly because that's who they are. And we know that perhaps there are other reasons that might have motivated that behavior. Leanne's husband, thank goodness, had the foresight to suggest that perhaps she think on it, perhaps there might be some other explanation. When you don't have dice in your pocket, a good friend is, an, is, an, is a nice alternative, so find them. They will hold you accountable to this. Um, what, what we were able to do is, is um, get more information over the next couple of days. Leanne was able to enter into a dialogue with her aunts, and as it turned out, we uncovered more information. It turns out Leanne should have rolled a source number five. And what that tells us is that there was a structural motivation issue present. Her aunts explained to her that had Leanne received the entire inheritance, the tax penalty would have been so great that it would have actually lowered the amount that she would have received. So to receive only a third of the inheritance actually increased the amount that went into her pocket. So we have a beef with Uncle Sam here, right? Um, not the aunts. The other reality is that there was a structural ability issue going on. And here's what it was. Marion, Leanne's mother, had taken a loan from her own mother, Leanne's grandmother. And no one imagined that Leanne's grandmother would survive her own daughter. So the will was written years ago to ensure that the loan would get repaid to the grandmother in the event that the grandmother was still alive upon Marion's death. The only way for Leanne to get any money whatsoever from this inheritance was for the grandmother's inheritance to be put into a family trust and to be divided evenly amongst all her heirs, which included Leanne and her two aunts. Can you imagine the consequences had Leanne not managed to get more information? A family splintered. You see stories and stories and stories about families who go for years without speaking to each other, fathers and sons estranged for 20 years, go to their grave, not, not working through issues. We know that this is real. If we are able to do this with the only family we have, with the people we love most in the world, how easy is it for us to do this to our colleagues? How easy is it for us to do this to our bosses who frustrate us and give us too much work? How easy is it for us to blame our organizations for treating us badly. And we settle on one source of influence and we recognize that we are very limited in solving that problem. My challenge to each of you is roll your dice. 
Imagine the possibilities, because when we do not, we often jump to problem solving the wrong problem. How many of you would respect a doctor who prescribed treatment without first diagnosing the problem? That would be scary, wouldn't it? And yet many of us do this every day, all day long, with the people we're trying to influence. So diagnose, consider the six sources as you think through tough issues. I best you. Thank you.